Our next speaker is a professor of history at the Department of History and Faculty Affiliate of the Asian Center, University of the Philippines. Her work focuses on the history of medicine and colonial Southeast Asia. She is currently deputy editor of the Regional Journal of Southeast Asian Studies, an international peer-reviewed journal that seeks to provide a platform for Southeast Asian scholars based in Southeast Asia to share their research internationally. Her book, Traditional Medicine in the Colonial Philippines, 16th to the 19th Century, UP Press 2017, was awarded Best Book in Science by the National Book Awards of the Philippines in 2018. To date, this book is the first book of history that won the science category in the National Book Awards. In the same year, she was awarded the Andrew Mellon Foundation Fellowship by the American Philosophical Society. In 2019, she was conferred the title University Scientist of the University of the Philippine System, a distinction that recognizes and supports the development of science and technology and encourage and reward scientific productivity. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome our next speaker, Ms. Maria Mercedes G. Planta. Uh, magandang umaga po sa lahat. Um, share ko na po uh, PowerPoint ko. Um, okay na po ba? Um, am I audible? Naririnig po ba ako? Yes, ma'am. Ah, okay. Sige. Um, sa organizers ng event na ito, especially to uh, Dr. Levy Labor, uh, I, I am very grateful for being part of this activity. Um, I took note of... Um, uh, uh, being famoso's uh, presentation and realized uh, when I first was invited to this activity, I have never heard of a Philippine Botanical Art Society. Probably because it is only three years, but I am very glad to be part of this activity, primarily because I am also one, uh, one with the vision of, of uh, this society, even if my take is um, history. So I will begin my presentation now. So my talk is about women, um, women's um, medicinal, the uses of medicinal plants, flowers, and plants with extraordinary qualities for women in the 16th and 17th century. Um, this uh, presentation is taken from my book, uh, Traditional Medicine in the Colonial Philippines. Um, I am talking, my topic today aims to also give us a range of the medicinal repertoire of traditional medical practitioners in the Philippines um, based on their knowledge of medicinal plants and herbs during the period under consideration, but with particular focus on, flower, on flowering plants. To argue that prior to colonialism, we Filipinos already have a defined medical tradition. The sources for my work, the earliest source is Francisco Ignacio Alcina's 1668 work. This was published in the 17th century, but Alcina's work document was not only the first to have documented um, Filipino uh, knowledge of medicinal plants, he was assigned in the Visayas area in Samar, but his work in the 17th century um, may have been published in the 17th century, but his, the, the plants that he documented were those plants that Filipinos have used for their uh, everyday ailment, ailments prior to the 17th century. So I argue that even if this book is in the 17th century, the plants that were documented were actually plants that Filipinos used prior to the coming of the Spaniards. So the work that I that of Alcino Alcina's work in 1668, I supplemented it with the work of Fernando Santa Maria in 1815. This is probably one of the most popular because while this book was originally originally written in Spanish, it was translated into Tagalog. So most probably, this work um, has been was very popular because it was the only work that was translated into Tagalog. Um, may I interrupt? Uh, uh, may, sure. Yes, may we, may we know if you are actually showing us a PowerPoint presentation? Oh, 
right now because oh, sorry. Oh, no. you're you very well. Teka, teka, teka. Oh, ano? po, ha? Sorry, ha? You're you very well, but we were wondering if we have slides. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Ah, sorry, sorry. Teka lang. Ayan, sorry. Nakalimutan ko mag-share. Sorry po. So, okay na po ba? Yes po. Ah, okay. Sorry po. Okay. So, dito na po tayo. So, um, so these are the, the sources for my work. So, again, this is the earliest work that noted, listed, identified uh, the Filipinos' um, uh, use of medicinal plants in the Philippines, confined only to the Visayas, particularly in Samar Island. From the work of Alcina, I supplemented his work with the work of um, Santa Maria in 1815. Again, as I have mentioned, this work is the only work of its kind that was translated into Tagalog. So presumably, very famous, or at least more popular to many people, popular in the sense that not only people knew about it, but the plants that were listed in Santa Maria's work were probably um, known to many Filipinos. So this was done in 1815. And um, the other work, of course, is um, Flora de Filipinas, Manuel Blanco's iconic work, published in the 19th century particularly in 1883 to 1893. This is a three-volume work that consisted of botanical plates, very beautiful, reissued by the San Agustin Museum in 1996. Note that all these three authors were Spanish missionaries. So the knowledge of Philippine medicinal plants in general, we owe to uh, the Spanish friars, who were the first to have been in close contact with the Filipinos, who were able to observe the Filipinos' way, ways of life and were able to witness that uh, the Filipinos' means of understanding their health, the way they address their health problems, were, were, um, were, were um, um, the, um, proof that Filipinos, despite the Spaniards' low regard of them, had ways effective ways of addressing their health problems. Eventually, um, the Spaniards established a botanical garden that was located in Intramuros. So the botanical garden was aptly named. It's, it has a very beautiful name, Real Jardin Botanico, the Royal Botanical Gardens of the Philippines. Um, of the many plants that were listed beginning in the work of Alcina to the work of um, uh, Santa Maria to the work of Blanco. Actually, after Blanco, the Americans came. They also built on those previous works. So you have the work of Merrill. You have the work of um, Trinidad Pardo de Tavera. Finally, in the 19th, 20th century, you have the work of Kisumbing, Eduardo Kisumbing. Um, Every single one of these authors, um, their works built on the works of the past. So from the work of Alcina in 1668 to the time of Trinidad Pardo de Tavera and eventually the compendium of works, the compendium that was made by Eduardo Kisumbing, botanist of the National Museum, they all built from one another. So from those works, I chose uh, medicinal plants that were flowering, dating back from the work of Alcina, but limiting only to those that have been scientifically identified. So, of course, the most famous is our Hibiscus rosa sinensis, our everyday gumamela that in Upilos Banos, they were able to cultivate and um, propagate with many different varieties in the 20th century. Now, this plate is taken from the work of um, Manuel Blanco. So, as um, being famoso has stated, um, Blanco's work is a visual treat for any one of you who 
has the chance to see it, was made in the 19th century by some of the Philippines' very first artists who set these things to print. But for our interest today, the Gumamela, from the time of um, Francisco Ignacio Alcina, um, it has a special use for women, especially for women suffering from menstrual cramps. So the gumamela's root is boiled as tea um, and then taken for those with menstrual cramps. Um, its buds, when they are not yet in bloom, when mixed with aloe vera and pounded and applied as plaster to the forehead, also seems to alleviate um, pain, particularly uh, menstrual cramps. I don't know why it's made in the it's placed in the forehead. Um, apart from menstrual cramps, the gumamela also has a special use. It is also used for inflammation. So the pounded buds mixed with lime is applied as plaster to the inflamed area. So it's supposed to soothe uh, whatever it is that is swelling, particularly probably in the legs. Um, when the buds fully bloom um, and it is uh, boiled, it can also induce sweat. Uh, we remember that Filipinos understand basic concepts of health as a balance between hot and cold. So when one is excessively, excessively hot, that means one has a fever, but to, to take out the fever, to make it go down, one has to sweat, sweat it out. So one of the ways to do that was to uh, boil the buds of, of the gumamela plant and then take it as a, as a drink to induce sweat and probably to relieve one of fever or a hot temperature. Um, the, other, the other plant, that we have is, um, of course, our national flower, the Sampagita, also known as Jasminum Sampa. Um, for many of us, this is very popular. It's immediate use. It's not only because it's very beautiful. It is a symbol of honor when you are given a garland of a Sampagita. It is also used as offering to, to our uh, venerated saints. But for women, in the 16th and 17th century, the Sampagita is more than just a beautiful flower. It is also um, a flower that aids women in childbirth because of its property to heal wounds. Um, according to Alcina, um, the, uh, the boiled um, Sampagita flower um, can be taken or can be applied, can be taken, but he says, but uh, the, the, the roots, sorry, the roots are, are boiled and, but must be used sparingly because a large amount could be dangerous. Um, the, the, the problem that I have encountered in my study are two things. Number one, um, sometimes the information is incomplete. Alcina says we have to use the roots of the Sampagita with caution. I don't know why, but I can only assume that probably because it can be, it can be harmful. I mean, it can burn you, probably. I, I don't really know. But these are the challenges of working with data at a, at a time when we have no means of looking of verifying them. The only way that I have um, done to adjust, to adapt, or to manage this limitation is to look at its scientific identification. There are many other plants that are that have been described by Alcina, by Santa Maria, by all the other uh, Spanish missionaries who tried to document these, um, these plants in the Philippines. Um, but um, another problem is that their documentation, sometimes they only relied on local names and the local names have no more bearing. So I have another one. It's called, um, 
uh, Dalupang. Dalupang now, when you Google it, the Dalupang that will appear is called um, uh, Urena uh, Lobata. But in my original list, it's called Urena Multifada. When you consult the plant list, botanists would tell you that the plant list is the most reliable scientific um, site that one can go to to verify plants. So in the plant list, the lupang is considered unresolved. But in the work of Alcina, Alcina describes it as a very beautiful flower. So while, while the gumamela and the sampaguita are not only very beautiful, but have medicinal properties, the dalupang is considered very valuable by women, not only because of beauty, but also because of its practical use. Now, this is the dalupang of the 21st century image that I have no way of knowing if this is what Alcina refers to. However, this is how describe the dalupang. From the work of Alcina, he noted the dalupang, which he also described as a weed that is considered interesting. So the leaves of the dalupang reminded him of the mallows of Spain, but the plant grew larger. This flower served as a clock, blooming all year long without fail. The beautiful blossoms, he notes, made him remember the white rose of Spain, simil similarly having five or six petals. The Dalupang flowers were yellow in color. What I found today are pink in color, but with reddish or flesh-like color of fine appearance and had a little fringe about the reddish fibers. Alcina relates how it was used by Visayan housewives, recording that the scentless Dalupang flower has an unusual characteristic. It always remains closed until about 9 o'clock in the morning, whether the sun is out or not. In the days before timekeeping devices, the women took its opening as a signal that it was time to prepare their midday meal so that after grinding their rice and making all the preparations, they ate, they ate at approximately noon. At three in the afternoon or a little later, the flower begins to slowly close until it is completely closed by sunset. The flowers last for many days as this pattern takes place. Colonial Filipinos planted this shrub near their houses and by its opening and closing, they knew how many hours of the day had elapsed and how many remained until nightfall. So apart from the Dalupang, there is also, there is one plant that is probably quite familiar to us. It's called Alas Cuatro. Alas Cuatro, when you go to the province, is still very much around. Why it's called Alas Cuatro? Because it blooms at 4 p.m. Punctually. I don't know if it's programmed for a Philippine, Philippine cock, and I have not experimented with it in, in, in places with different time zones, but these are very cute things that um, most people do not really know about, except probably flower enthusiasts. Now, there is another plant of the Visayans that has no scientific correspondence at all. It's called the Kalipayan. It's a flowering plant with variegated leaves with blends of green and yellow. When it blooms, the blossom is seen to be entirely pure and white. By nine in the morning, it starts to grow rosy, its color eventually deepening into a bright red hue. Later still, it grows redder. The flower is gone by the next day and the leaves are all dull and dark. So these are some of the flowering plants that Filipinos, especially women, value for their medicinal properties, not only for their beauty, and also for their practical use. Um, there are other plants that um, I have identified. So you have the castor oil, which uh, women use for hair and scalp treatment. Of course, we have the very famous aloe vera that we know dates back from the time of Alcina and its use for its properties for hair growth. Um, we have um, the Philippine tongue, 
or baloconal that I have identified as Silutelis triperma used by women, especially mothers, for their children who have um, flies or puto. These are just some of the many plants that the Philippines is rich with. Um, the plants are divided not only as flowering plants, there are also trees, but there are also plants of animal, uh, there are also cures of animal origin. But the point of the study is that as of now, we have nearly scratched the surface of our resources. I have chosen these plants not only because they are familiar, but because they are everyday plants that we see but are not necessarily aware of. Um, their properties have helped Filipinas in many instances in the past. And today, in the period of the pandemic, where uh, we are led to rediscover our, uh, our environment, our natural, natural resources, perhaps it is a, this is a good time to, to look back and to um, you know, encourage many of us that uh, some of the med medical everyday practical needs that we encounter or that we have to confront, uh, the solutions are just right in our backyard. Maraming salamat po. Okay po. Thank, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Planta, for sharing that very interesting session with us. I personally did not know of the many uses of our endemic flowers. I mean, who would have thought that not only is the Sampagita a beautiful flower, but it also aided women of the past with childbirth. I mean, that's pretty amazing. So thank you so much, Dr. Planta, for sharing your time with us today. Okay, 